Good morning, friends, and happy Sabbath. We just would like to welcome you to our service this morning. Wherever you are, whoever you are, it's truly a blessing to be found at God's feet this morning. You know, it's been six months since we last gathered as a church. It's been six months that we've been under lockdown due to the pandemic around us. And during this time, it has required many of us to reflect on our relationship with God. It's required of us to make some changes around how we interact and worship with God. To some, it hasn't been easy. We and others have lost their lives. They have lost employment. But we are thankful to God that He has still been in control. You know, I'm reminded of the experience of the Israelites who encountered as well challenges, but they were not grateful for what the Lord had done for them. And they did not recognize how God was leading them, even as they encountered the Red Sea. And the Bible says in Exodus 14 and verse 14, the Bible says that the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. So during this past six months, I just would like to humbly submit to you that the Lord has been fighting for you. And I trust that you have been able to hold your peace, that you have been able to reach a point in your life where you have been at peace with the circumstances around us. Because soon and very soon, our Heavenly Father will come and we ought to be ready to meet Him in the air. So let us bow our heads at this time as we go into our service this morning. Let us pray. Our Father in Heaven, we are thankful that you are still a God, a God that is in control of the affairs of this world. We are thankful, Lord, for the fact that you continue to fight for each one of us. Regardless of the circumstances we face, the changes that we've had to make, but Lord, you are still there for us. So continue to be with us this morning as we shall sit at your feet. May your name be glorified. As Mama pray in Jesus' name, Amen. So this morning, friends, we will be blessed as the Action Unit reflects on this last quarter and the work that is taking place in the West Central Africa Division. And thereafter, we will be blessed by a familiar friend and a former pastor of our church, Pastor Gitzman, as he will share God's word to us. So may you be blessed as we sit at God's feet. Amen.
Welcome and good morning to everyone and a happy Sabbath to you all. The invitation to spread the gospel demands a constant action from the, mission, from the missionary mission of the church. This work does not depend on the four seasons. Winning souls is a work that goes on all year and which entitles planning from the church leaders in order to prepare us, all the members of the church, our scriptures reading taken from Matthew 28, verse 19 to 20. Here we find three great truths. Number one, the Gospel Commission is a great missionary char charter of Christ's kingdom. Number two, evangelize is the church as the skeleton is to the body. Number three, the church is a missionary organization by the nature and the concentration. With these words in mind, brothers and sisters, I welcome you to all the 13th quarter, the 13th Sabbath program for this morning. May you all be blessed and as we reflect. Amen. Good morning, Sabbath School members. This quarter features God's missionaries from the West Central African Division. We have received stories specifically from Liberia, Guinea and Gabon. Liberia is known for its detailed decorative mosques, wood carvings of realistic human faces and carved accessories, particularly combs, spoons and forks. About 85.5% of Liberia's population practices Christianity and Muslims comprise 12.2% of the population. On April 30, 1930, the first four Adventist converts were baptized at Liberia. Guinea's mineral wealth makes it potentially one of Africa's richest countries, but its people are among the poorest in West Africa. The life expectancy in Guinea is 56 years, and only 27% of adults can read. The work in Guinea began in 1987, when a lay couple from Europe quietly witnessed to their faith. In April 1992, the first war refugees from Liberia arrived in Guinea, including a number of Seventh-day Adventists and the licensed pastor, who soon began witnessing for their faith. Low population density, abundant petroleum, and foreign private investments have helped make Gabon one of the most prosperous countries in sub-Saharan Africa. About 73% of the population practice at least some elements of Christianity, and the Adventist Church was officially re recognized by the government of Gabon in 1981. Over the past few weeks, we have been following the story of Maria, who was led to the knowledge of God through her dreams and televisions. Although she had never learned how to read, she was quickly about to read scripture from the Bible. Her family, mother especially, was angry about her becoming a Christian and tried to kill her numerous times but failed. Today we find out whether her mother succeeded in her plans to kill Maria. Mother took matters into her own hands after failing to convince her daughter Maria to renounce Christ. She slipped a sleeping pill into Maria's drink at a restaurant. With the help of Maria's younger sister, she carried her unconscious daughter to the car and drove her to their home village in Guinea. Maria's five-year-old son, Mark, came along. Mother was a wealthy business owner, and the family compound in the village contained a multi-story mansion, a luxurious guest house, and several other buildings. A high fence surrounded the property, and a watchman kept a close eye on the gate. Maria was locked in a bedroom. Mother had a nefarious plan. She had hired a Nigerian witch doctor to change Maria's mind about Jesus. I will never deny Jesus, even if you kill me, Maria said when she saw the witch doctor. I will worship Jesus, even if I do not go to church. Jesus is everywhere. The witch doctor smiled grimly. Your mother told me that she has tried and failed to kill you many times, he said. But let me tell you that I have something more powerful than you, Jesus. He mixed a strange powder with water and forced Maria to drink. Later, he rubbed a strange lotion on her body. Deny Jesus or die, he said. Maria refused. I will never deny Jesus, she said. Mother helped the witch doctor with the work. One day, she applied a strange powder on Maria's face. Sores broke out on her skin, and the next day, 
She was bleeding everywhere. Maria's son, Mark, did not understand what was happening to his mother. When he saw the sore-covered face, he wept, but he remembered praying with his mother every night before bed. He begged Maria's younger sister, Hajar, to pray with him. Hajar agreed, but first made sure that mother was nowhere nearby. Jesus, please help mom, Mark prayed. Help her get well. Seven months passed. Maria grew so weak that she could barely move. Her flesh smelled like it was rotting. Hajar was afraid and called one of Maria's Adventist friends. Maria is dying, she said. Please pray. The friend asked to speak with Maria, but Hajar explained that Maria was too weak. She snapped a photo of Maria on her cell phone. The Adventist friend wept when he received it. Good morning and happy Sabbath to everybody. I will be reading the second part of the mission story. I see that your mother wants to kill her, he said. I'll ask all of the church members to pray. The church members across Guinea prayed for Maria. After a few days, the Adventist friend called Haja. I know it would be difficult for Maria to travel, but can you help her escape, he said. I will send money. Haja promised to try. And the Adventist friend contacted Jacob Gibali, the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Guinea, who sent money for the car fare to Conakry. I just saw her chance on a Friday morning while mother was away on business. The witch doctor left her house on an errand and Haja sent the watchman out to buy something at the store. Opening the gate of the compound, she hailed a passing car and paid the driver to take Maria and walk to the church headquarters in Conakry. As Maria and Mark travelled, a small commotion erupted at the church's headquarters. The church watchman spotted a green, yellow and brown snake in a mango tree by the front gate and called for help. But when the other men arrived, the snake was nowhere to be found. Later that day, Maria and her son arrived and were taken to a guest room. The exhausted mother slept. The next morning on Sabbath, church elders anointed Maria and prayed for her at the church located on the compound. As they prayed, Maria fell, fell to the floor unconscious. When she regained consciousness, she was confused and her body ached. Michael, the executive secretary and treasurer of the Adventist Church in Guinea, carried her back to the guest room to rest. As she slept, a green, yellow and brown snake slithered to her window and entered a hole in the wall, trying to find a way into the room. It was the snake from the mango tree. A church member noticed the one meter snake and called for help. A crowd gathered outside the window trying to coax the snake out of the hole. Someone made a makeshift torch by placing a plastic bag dosed in gasoline on the end of a wooden stick and, light, and lit it. When they thrust the fiery stick into the, the hole, the snake leaped out the, and tumbled to the ground. Michael jumped on the snake, crushing its head instantly. Hours later, Maria's cell phone rang with a call from an unknown number. She was afraid to answer, but the person kept calling back. If they'll keep calling you, it must be important, a church friend said. Answer it. The caller was Maria's younger sister, Haja. I just wanted to tell you, you have time to get well, she said. I know that you will get well now. Why don't you, why do you say that? Maria asked. Listen, Haja said. Can you hear the sound of the ambulance? Ambulance? What happened? Maria said. Did something happen to mother? No, not to mother, Haja said. The witch doctor from Nigeria, he fell from the second floor of our house. He struck the ground head first and died instantly. His skull was crushed. The next day, Maria's sores began to disappear. Maria has given up everything for Jesus. A luxurious home and successful shop. Two cars and a comfortable life. Mother still wants to kill her. So she, can, she and Mark are in hiding, but her love for Jesus is strong. 
She is praying about becoming a missionary to her people. I dream about seeing my people becoming Christian. And she said, I want to talk to them about Jesus. I cannot keep this truth to myself. I must share the good news with the people. The Seventh-day Adventist Church faces enormous challenges in the spreading of the gospel in Guinea. Other parts of the West Central African Division, you can help people like Maria and Mark by giving to the 13th Sabbath offering today. Not all of us can go overseas and especially in the position we find ourselves in, a, in at the moment. We have to find different ways to evangelize. It may be difficult, but it is not impossible. Ellen White says in Acts of the Apostle, chap chapter 3, paragraph 28, that the disciples were to work earnestly for souls, giving, all, giving to all the invitations of mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to go to the people with their message. The type of evangeliz evangelism is based on a personal relationship. When we develop a genuine friendship with people, it creates a bond of trust, spiritual interest, and uh, develops logically and naturally from this friendship. If the church is finally going to make a deep impression on a secular society, Pers person a personal relationship will, will have to play a special role we are not to encourage we are not encouraging you to go out to areas put others at risk but we are to take the necessary precautions make us make use of a social media platform encourage one another with a song send literature to the door of someone's house who you know needs to learn about God from a friendship with people and show them that the God we serve is bigger than the coronavirus. We, we are privileged to have freedom of expression and religion but many Christians around the world are beginning of being persecuted. Many are putting their lives at risk to reach the unreached in the remote areas we, where the gospel has not been preached but they cannot be cannot do it alone they need a financial help and our continual prayers the 13th Sabbath offering this quarter will help to construct the Kowaya Academy a K-12 school School in Conakry, Guinea. Open an ele elementary school cen center of influence in Liberia. Establish a media center in Abuja, Nigeria. Lord, I'm working on a door. It's a true foundation. I'm holding up the blood stain that I fall my love. Oh, I never get tired. Never get tired. And I'm running on heaven. You're gonna get my reward. I'm working on the door. And it's a true foundation. I'm holding up the blood. I never get tired of working on it. I'm working on a building and I'm running. And gonna get my reward. Sometimes I'm crying. But I'm working on a building. I'm holding up the blood. Say, man, I'm on my lawn. Oh, I never get tired. Tired of working on a building. Yeah.
it. Yeah, I'm never I'm working tired. Working on, I'm working on a building. I'm running up the hill and gonna get my reward. started when I changed jobs. My salary shrank significantly, but my spending habits remained the same. I sank deeper into debt, and it was all my fault. I felt horrible. Before changing jobs, I had given 10% of my gross income as tithe, 10% of offerings, and 10% for charity. Now, I was only returning tithe, and it would take at least four years for me to become debt-free. But I didn't want to wait that long. I thought about Malachi 3. God challenges us to test them with our tithes and offerings. I took a very deep breath, made the decision to give 10% of my gross income as a missionary offering in addition to the tithe. The truth is, I was hoping to find some freelance work so I could make up for the offering money. But you know what happened? No extra work showed up. But you know what also happened? 10 months after I started giving the offerings, I was debt free. Don't ask me how. I guess it's God's math. He never gave extra money, but he made my life cheaper. There was this one time when I had to buy an airline ticket to go visit my ill father, and the round trip ticket cost me only $110, $140 less than the usual. After that, a friend volunteered to drive me to the airport, sparing me the cost of an Uber ride. Then some friends asked me to stay in their spare bedroom, rent-free. Can you see how God's math works? The list goes on and on. As you return your tithe and give your promise, 
challenge the Lord. Test Him and be a witness of how transforming and joyful it is to depend entirely on Him. May we put our desires last and God first. Boys and girls, and a very happy Sabbath to each and every one of you. Welcome to the Winsworth Kids Corner. Before we begin, let's close our eyes in prayer. Dear God, thank you for today. Thank you for bringing us together. Open our hearts and our minds to hear and accept your word. Thank you for choosing me to share your word with these children. In your precious and holy name, Amen. Today, our memory verse is taken from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. And this is how it reads. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of age. Do you know that God has a very important job for me and you? Can I tell you what it is? Before I do that, I want to show you some items that I have received from the post office. Let's have a look. A postcard. A bowl. And a letter that Ava and Matt have received from their granny in Australia. Sometimes you can even receive birthday party invitations through the post. Do you know who delivers your post? That's right, it's the postman. Have you ever stopped to think what will happen if the postman doesn't deliver your mail? We won't receive our important notices, our bowls, our postcards, our letters from our loved ones. So now, do you have an idea of what the important job Jesus has for you and I? We are commanded by God to spread the gospel, start churches and tell others about Christ. This sending is called the Great Commission, as Jesus is sending us out to perform an essential task on his behalf. These instructions are critical to who we are as Christians. These instructions were given to God, were given by God to his disciples before he ascended into heaven and he reminded them that he would always be with them. How can you and I fulfill the great commission of Jesus? Tell people about Jesus, invite people to church and Sabbath school and share the love of Jesus with them. It is a blessing to have the opportunity to take part in helping God bring the world into a relationship with Him. Just as mail is sent out, God sends us out to share God's love with others. Let you and I be like postmen and deliver the good news messages. We are now going to watch a video that shows us what happens when children like you hear the good news. You and I can help more boys and girls hear that God loves them. Amen. Emmanuel wanted to annoy 13-year-old Aggie during a break between French and physics classes at the Seventh-day Adventist School in Libreville, Gabon. He knew that Aggie had a short temper, so he started saying mean things. Annoyed, Aggie immediately slapped the boy on the cheek. Emmanuel didn't like being slapped, and he slapped Aggie back. Now Aggie was furious. He punched Emmanuel. Children crowded around the fighting boys. Don't stop, they yelled. Let them fight. A teacher's assistant came running, causing the children to scatter to their seats. He pulled them apart. Why are you fighting? He was mean to me, Aggie said. He hit me, Emmanuel said. You shouldn't fight. Fighting is for animals. Apologize. As punishment, the boys had to spend two hours away from the other children, quietly thinking about what they had done. It was a long two hours. After some time, Aggie whispered to Emmanuel, Why were you mean to me? I was only joking, Emmanuel whispered back. 
Aggie wished that he hadn't lost his temper. That summer, Grandfather sent Aggie to a Pathfinder campout. Aggie's Bible teacher also went to the campout, and he spoke for morning and evening worship. At the end of the three-week campout, he asked whether any children wanted to give their hearts to Jesus. He told them how Jesus could change their hearts. Instead of anger, he could give them peace and love. When Aggie heard that, he remembered his short temper. He remembered how his temper led to fights and made his parents unhappy. He wanted to change and he prayed, Lord, I want to follow you. Then Aggie stood up and went to the front. People were surprised to see him standing. His Bible teacher was happy that he wanted to be baptized. After baptism, when Aggie came out of the river, he felt the same as before. He thought maybe something miraculous would have happened, but everything still seemed normal. But as the days passed, he noticed that he no longer enjoyed many things of the past. His friends noticed that he wasn't easily angered like before. Just the other day, Emmanuel brought some cakes to sell in class, and Aggie didn't want to buy one. I don't want to buy anything today, he said. I'm not feeling well. Come on, buy one, Emmanuel said. No, I can't, Aggie said. Emmanuel's face twisted in anger and he slapped Aggie. But Aggie didn't feel angry at all, and he quietly walked away. He was so grateful that with Jesus' help, his days of having a short temper were over. Jesus was changing his heart. In 2017, part of the 13th Sabbath offering helped construct a high school for 280 students in Aggie's hometown of Libreville, Gabon. Thank you for helping change lives through the 13th Sabbath offering. It makes a big difference.
Good morning, Wentworth Church. Uh, it is such a privilege to share God's word with you. It's been a while, but I'm sure that God has kept you in his care and that you are still well and that by God's grace, you will be blessed today. Let us just pause a moment as we pray. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you now. And as we spend some time in your word, Father, we ask that you may come and lead us in a very special way. Guide us, Lord, and give us understanding. Open our eyes, give us insight. Move amidst your people in different areas that we find ourselves in. I pray, Lord, that your hand of mercy may be on each uh, member of the Wentworth Church and that as we spend time opening your word that you may remove whatever hindrance lord cleanse us from all unrighteousness and cover us with your blood these things we pray in your loving name amen john chapter 6 uh, verse 15 and to 21 john chapter 6 uh, verse 15 uh, to verse 21 if you have your Bibles, you can follow with me. Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into the boat and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was already dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. Then the sea arose, because a great wind was blowing. So when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near the boat, and they were afraid. But he said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. Then they willingly received him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at the land, where they were going. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. When you search for him, when you search for him, sometimes he will at first seem hidden to you. It is Capernaum. This was the headquarters of Jesus during his Galilean ministry. Because of the unbelief of his hometown of Nazareth, uh, for years they had expected the Messiah to come. They waited for him. They anticipated his coming into the world. Yet when he came, the Bible says, they did not perceive him. How could this be the Christ, the one who would sit with thieves and the lowest of society? 
How could this be the Christ, the one who has been baptized by John the Baptist, a weird fellow from the desert nonetheless, who sustained himself through locust and honey? How could this be the Messiah? How could this be the Christ, a man who would basically spend time with the harlots of society? As if somehow he was part of the drunken crowds. How could this be the Christ? But on this one specific day, many started to believe that he probably must be the Messiah. Which other man would feed more than 5,000 plus people? According to the rabbinical mindset, of course, he must be the super Moses come to rescue them from the Romans as Moses rescued Israel from the Egyptians. And Jesus knew within himself that this miracle, though for some it was a revelation of who he truly was, yet for others he perceived that their understanding of him as their savior was nothing near what the kingdom of God intended it to be. Now let me pause a moment there and ask you, friend, uh, when you understand or when you search for God, do you make him out to be what he is not? Do you, do you see the kingdom as something totally different to what God intended the kingdom of God to be? He perceived that amidst the jostling and the bustling crowd, that some actually sought to make him that day what he had never come to be, a king to claim Jewish dominion over the Romans. But this was never his purpose, never his goal, never was the something that he aspired to. This was merely mankind's view of what kingship actually meant. The Bible says that he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Oh, be careful, friends, that you do not make God out to be what he is not. Be careful that you do not think or conjure up an idea of your own image of God. He may have to remove his presence from you for you to search for the true him and find him. He perceived that amidst the same unperceiving crowd that some only sought him that day because their physical need had been met and would have never considered him otherwise. Yet the Bible says in Isaiah 61 verse 1 that he came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to bring good news to the afflicted. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. He came to bring freedom to prisoners. He came to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord to comfort all those who mourn. The Bible states that immediately he made his disciples uh, to get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. When he had sent them away, the verb actually means to separate oneself, to withdraw oneself, to take leave from someone. You see, when your understanding of God and what he represents is limited due to your unwillingness to give up your misconceived ideologies of who he is, you are left standing on a shore looking into the abyss while darkness falls, which I believe was the position that many found themselves in that day because they were unwilling to give up what they thought was the kingdom of God, what they thought Jesus Christ had come for. And so Jesus withdrew himself from the crowd. He then sends his disciples away. And now you find that those who perhaps did not leave when they were sent away by Jesus now stand there as darkness falls, trying to understand, trying to search for this Jesus. Now, if you misunderstand the mission of God upon this earth, you will always be left behind. God cannot move you forward if you are unwilling to be moved. 
If you are unwilling to understand the significance of God's work in the significance of his kingdom, the principles, the characteristics of his kingdom, if you are unwilling to move away from your mere material interpretation of God's working, if you see him as a mere provider to your physical needs, your wants or protection, then your interpretation of God is nothing more than a Greek mythological understanding of God. Never should, one writer says, we be deceived by the popularity of Jesus Christ among certain kinds of people today. Very few want him as Savior and Lord. Many want him as healer or provider or the one who rescues them from the problems they sometimes have placed upon themselves. And Jesus basically said, and he will not call to me that he may have life. The reason you search for Jesus is so that you will find eternal life. The reason you come to him wholeheartedly, giving up everything, is so that Jesus can lead you to paths of righteousness. Perceiving these things, Jesus withdrew from everyone to the mountain by himself alone, the Bible says. There he went to meet his beloved father in prayer, in solitude, in silence. I want to pause there a moment and say, friends, that if there is any place that you ought to search for God, it is in the solitude silence of your life. It is not within a bedlam of noise that you'd be able to find Jesus. You need to find Jesus there where it is quiet where you are able to hear God speak to you, not audibly, of course, but through his spirit, with his word open, allowing your thoughts to contemplate upon him. I imagine that he must have had a special place of prayer, a special place of solitude, silence, perhaps a little cave that no animal dared to make his home. Perhaps amid some patch of grass which by now had been flattened due to his constant visits there. Perhaps some burning bush that he alone could step into. Allow me to imagine, friends. Oh, beloved, Christ knew where God the Father could be found. He knew where the best places for one-on-one -on -one with his father was. He knew that he was God and that he was connecting with his father God. If you're searching for God, there is no other name on high that can be called upon other than the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but through me. Some of us think that the way to salvation is through the church. <laughs> Some think that the way to salvation is through a pharisaical way of life, burdening others with what God has never burdened men. As he removed himself from the presence of those who sought to place their own ideas upon him. And the night fell while the disciples were crossing the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. Waiting upon their master seemed endless. And doesn't it all so often seem endless when we are facing trials, when we're going through tribulation, it seems like somehow God has left us, like somehow uh, he's no longer present with us. Somehow he's removed his presence from us. Somehow in our thinking, he's nowhere to be seen. Perhaps doubt began to set in with the disciples. Maybe he had left them, would have been the thoughts of none other than the doubting Thomas. Oh, even Judas became weary now because his road to fame was hanging on the balance. The sea now became restless with anticipation. <laughs> Nature always groans at the anticipation of action from its creator. 
Uh, for we know the whole creation groans and suffers together until now, Romans 8 says. Did Jesus know that the storm was coming? I pause to wonder this. If Jesus knew that the storm was coming, why would he send his disciples, his closest companions, over the Sea of Galilee when he knew that they may not even make it to the other side? Of course he knew. Why would he not have known? Then why did he deliberately send his friends into danger? Why does he deliberately allow us to go through trials and tribulations? Why does he deliberately uh, place us in positions sometimes where we see the tribulation that he is pressing hard upon us? Oh friends, one writer says that he was rescued them from a greater danger. The danger of being swept along by a fanatical crowd. Let me pause a moment there. There are so many fanatical crowds today, not only outside of the church, but also inside of the church. So many have removed Christ from the picture. So many have diminished the divinity of Christ. So many have even removed the Holy Spirit's working in their lives. Sometimes the Lord must balance our lives. Otherwise, we will become proud and then we will be easily led into temptation. And the disciples had experienced this great joy in being part of the thrilling miracle of feeding the 5,000. Now they had to face the storm and learn to trust in the Lord even more. The feeding of the 5,000 was the lesson, but the storm was the examination after the lesson. Sometimes we are caught in a storm because we have disobeyed the Lord. Jonah is an example. But sometimes the storm comes because we have obeyed the Lord. Sometimes we in the storm because we have disobeyed him. Sometimes we in the storm because we have obeyed the Lord. Whatever happens, friends, you can be sure that our Savior will pray for us. Which is what he went to do on the mountain with his father that day. He went to pray for his disciples. Not to remove the storm, but that their faith will hold strong through the storm. <laughs> and yes, definitely he will come to us and deliver us. He will always draw close to your side. The Bible says that he had rode for about, they had rode for about three miles. They were approximately halfway across the lake when Jesus came walking to them on the water. Oh, forgive me, friends, I get excited. You see, Mark then comes along and Mark throws a spanner in the works and you think, but Lord, <laughs> these men have been struggling the entire night. Mark comes and he says, listen, uh, he intended to pass them by. <laughs> he saw them toiling in rowing, uh, basically the verb is translated to torture, to be harassed, to be distressed. He, he saw them being distressed. He, he saw them being harassed. He, he saw them toiling, being tortured. Yet Mark says he, he intended to pass them by. <laughs> Yet he, he comes to them. Not immediately after he has sent them away. He only comes to them, the Bible says, during the fourth watch of the night. It, is, it was between three or six in the morning that he comes to them. Now I need to pause there, friends. You remember that when Jesus removes himself from the crowd, when he sends his disciples over the Sea of Galilee, it is only beginning to get dark. 
So from the time it has begun to get dark until about three to four to maybe five or six in the morning, these disciples have been struggling to get to the other side. And Mark says he intended to pass them by. <laughs> oh, when, when, when Jesus walks on the sea, he, the word on, which is used with the genitive case, signifies contact. Our Lord's sandals, if he had sandals on, if he was not walking barefoot, actually had contact with the water. He walked on the surface of the sea as if it was pavement. I need to pause for you to just allow that to sink in. He made contact with the water. Oh yes, friends. You see, when you search for him, when you wait upon him, he will always make contact with your distresses or with your tribulation. He will always be above your trials and tribulation. He will always be greater than whatever you may think is too great for him. He will literally walk over it. He would have passed them by, comes from a verb which means hood, thelo. It means I desire. He desired to pass them by. But the word by also means beside. And so he passed is basically to go to. And he leaves, this leaves the impression then that our Lord desired to pass them by. But he went out on that turbulent sea in order to go to the help. The, the preposition which is para when, when used in composition with a verb as it is here denoted is a situation or emotion either from the side of or the side of or the side to. Thus it means to be beside or by next to something. So the context basically comes and says he was desiring to go to their side, making contact with their distresses. But the Bible says they were frightened. Many times we think that God is far removed from our trials, far away from us when we are going through troublesome times. Matthew then comes and records that Peter even walked on the water. Fearing for his life after taking his eyes off the master. But the most amazing part of the story is when Christ gets into the boat, the storm is calmed. John in his version emphasizes a different aspect altogether than Mark. He brings in the word I am. Jesus revealing his more intimate relationship to his father now. He uses the same form of words to the Samaritan woman. Once they take Jesus on board, the I am, their anxieties are put to rest and they immediately reach their destination. In this brief story, friends, all the elemental fears that have so often uh, placed fear within the hearts of humankind is being overcome. The chaos of darkness, the abyss of or the watery abyss, which is described in the first chapter of Genesis is overcome here by the one who was in the beginning with God. The word of God, the first expressed at the creation is active in the real world, being experienced by those who put their trust in him and he will always reveal himself. Verse 20 says that amidst their fears, Jesus exclaimed, it is I, literally, I am. I am the covenant 
God, the Old Testament God, the God of Yahweh. I am the one who has brought Israel through the Red Sea. There is nothing you need to fear here. The water goes according to my command. It is the I am that parted the Red Sea for Israel. It is the I am that opened the waters of the Jordan so that the Israelites could once again go into the promised land. It is the I am that that fed the hungry Israelites within the 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 desert. It is the I am who quenched their thirst when we were th when they were thirsty. It is the visible I am, the full self-revelation of God, the incarnate word of God, the true and the only son. The disciples fear, even though Jesus is walking towards them. They suppose that it was a ghost. When you search for him, is your heart open enough to perceive who he really is for they all saw him and they were terrified they immediately spoke Jesus to them take courage it is I do not be afraid be of good cheer be not afraid it also means to take good courage some may encourage you negatively <laughs> But when Christ comes into the picture, he will always encourage you toward the good. Exactly what the disciples needed was to hear the words, It is I, I am Yahweh, and no one else. Be not afraid. The present imperative is used here. Forbidding the continuance of an action already going on. It means stop being afraid now. Stop this action of being afraid. Stop looking around at your trials and tribulations. Stop focusing on the things that are insignificant. The I am is present now in your life and there is nothing more you need to fear. Stop being afraid. There is no reliable historical data. One writer says that any of the founders of the world's major religions apart from Jesus ever claimed to be God. No early writings attest such a claim on behalf of these persons. The Old Testament places no leader or prophet on God's level. Rather, we are told that God will not share his glory with anyone else. <laughs> oh, let me pause, friends. You see, in order for God to become big, the I am, the Yahweh in your life, he cannot and he will not contend with anything else. You need to give up everything and allow him to fill you completely because he doesn't need to contend with anything else. He is God, the only God. The only son who came to die in our stead. Therefore, the Bible says, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Romans also says concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of his holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. But only Jesus can declare the path to salvation. Only Jesus can lead you to that path. And he always takes you through the storm. He immediately, the Bible says, they immediately reach the land which they were going to. <laughs> you see, Mark indicated that they had been rowing halfway across, across the lake. The wind has now ceased. It means the verb to grow weary or tired, to cease from violence and raging. When Jesus comes, you'll see into the picture, the raging and the violence 
cannot exist in his presence. The noun form means to beat or to toil with weariness, to the sea sank to rest as if exhausted by its own beating. You cannot stand against God and succeed. Even nature cannot contend with God. What then, the Bible says, shall we say to things, these things, if, if God is for us, who can be against us? Who can contend with God? But if you're going to contend with God, if you're going to be raging and, and beating and toiling against God, know that at one or other time he will come and still the storm. Whether that be to your benefit or not. When Christ gets into the boat, the storms are put to rest. If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> when God gets into the boat, there is nothing but smooth sailing ahead. The boat immediately reaches to where it has been trying to get to the entire night. With Christ in your boat, the sin that you think you may, that may be holding you down can be removed in an instant. All you have to do is call upon him, call upon his name, give him place in your life, give him place in your boat, take him into your heart and allow him to effect change for you. Oh yes, he can calm the storms of life. He can calm the raging and the toils that so easily beset us. I declare to you at this time, friends, this God, this loving Jesus, who is able to come and calm the storm for you. I pray that you may take this Jesus into your life. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you now. We say thank you that through your divine hand, through your divine, powerful, almighty being, you are able to come and calm the storms. Calm the storms of our lives, Father. Come and reign supreme within us. May we not contend with thee. And may we not have things in our lives that contend with thee. For we know that you are greater than nature itself, creator, supreme, eternal, most wonderful God. Come and rescue us. Come and rescue some of us, even from ourselves. These things we pray in your loving name. Amen.